Namaste. Um, my name is Ashish Kothari. I work with an Indian environmental group called Kalpavriksh and I am also part of some global networks working on issues of uh, sustainability, justice and, and equity. And I'd like to talk to you today about uh, what I think are some really exciting pathways towards a, uh, a much more sustainable, much more just, much more equitable world uh, going towards 2050 and, and beyond. Before I actually start, you know, before I talk about the sort of larger framework of that future uh, society, I'd like to begin with a couple of uh, stories uh, from the ground, so so to speak, which which I know a little bit about. This is uh, a village in central India called Mendha Lekha. It's an indigenous village, and over the last 25 years or so, they have entered into some a really remarkable transformation. Uh, of uh, first of all starting with resisting two uh, large hydroelectricity projects that would have displaced them which they stopped and then also sort of uh, rebuilding their their uh, political uh, and economic base they created their own village assembly and took a decision, took a decision that they would take uh, all the decisions for the village would be taken by they themselves not by any government bureaucrat or politician or whatever and that they would take control over the entire uh, territory that they belong to uh, and uh, use it sustainably for being able to generate uh, maximum uh, livelihood security, water security, energy security and so on. And they've been able to actually achieve that in the last uh, 25 years or so. They have a very interesting slogan which they say that we elect the government in New Delhi and Mumbai but in our village, we are the government. That's the village of, uh, of Medaleka. But the second story is from, uh, from Europe, uh, from an urban context. This is the Cooperativa Integral Catalonia, which is a uh, several hundred people who are involved in what is called social or solidarity economy activities. Uh, collective uh, you know, organic farming, uh, consumer cooperatives, uh, housing cooperatives, transportation, um, uh, local currencies, uh, non-monetized exchange, basically trying to see how uh, you know how you can envision and actually practice a much more localized economy which uh, is able to resist the kind of uh, uh, the, the kind of domination of corporations that we have in our lives uh, otherwise. Now, uh, these are just two out of literally thousands and thousands of stories around the world of people doing inspiring things, people actually resisting the dominant uh, destructive system and also finding new ways of being able to do things. Now, based on uh, my understanding, limited understanding of a number of these stories, um, I, you know, some of us have been talking about uh, a framework which we call radical ecological democracy which is essentially where uh, we're trying to uh, propose a system in which people, ordinary people, you and I, uh, are actually central to decision making. We don't leave that decision making to bureaucracies and, and corporations and governments and so on. We are very much central to that uh, decision making, to the political process, and we do decision making in ways that are ecologically sensitive, which are sensitive to other human beings or socially uh, sensitive, other sensitive to other species and so on. Now, we, uh, there are sort of five crucial elements to this. And I think of it as in terms of sort of, of five, uh, let's say, uh, interlinking, interlocked circles. Uh, the first one, this is not in or any order of priority, but the first one would be uh, radical democracy. If you go back to the example that I took of Medhalekha village in India, uh, it's really about people in the villages, in urban neighborhoods, in educational institutions, wherever there is a collective of people uh, taking the decisions for the things that affect their lives themselves or being very central to that decision making process. And then building on that grassroots or direct or radical democracy, you have larger institutions of representative democracy which are accountable to those grassroots institutions. It's sort of the reverse of what we have right now where the representatives that we choose once in every three years or five years in, elect in elections eventually begin to have much more power than the citizens that elect them. So it's reversing that where citizens continue to have that core power. 
but also going beyond that looking at how decision making can happen not in the current political uh, boundaries necessarily but boundaries or, or uh, uh, landscapes of, which are ecologically and culturally detined, determined those eco regions or bio regions as, as they are called and if we actually take that to its logical extent we are saying this is decision making which uh, even begins to challenge or dissolve nation states and I can see that by 2050 we would have already started doing some of this kind of uh, uh, transformations in the political landscape. The second uh, core circle would be economic democracy where uh, instead of private corporations or governments holding the reins of economic power it would be the producers whether it's farmers or it's craftspersons or it's uh, workers in factories or whatever uh, wherever there are people who are actually doing the work would be the ones who are controlling the means of production and uh, as consumers also we would be having much greater say in what we are consuming uh, what is there available for us for consumption which is safe which is safe for ourselves for, which is safe for the earth uh, which is fair which is just and so on uh, and this, uh, this economic democracy would also of course mean much more localization of the at least in terms of self-reliance of the basic needs. I mean, why should I depend for my water or my food on somebody 3,000 miles away? It has to come from within a certain eco-region uh, around me. And you can actually localize the economy for at least all basic basic needs. And then you have trade built on that uh, for other kinds of uh, purposes. Economic democracy would also mean uh, much greater uh, reliance on caring and sharing. Uh, reducing the, the dominance of money in our lives and actually rebuilding relation, economic relationships where, which are non-monetized or which are based on local uh, democratic decentralized uh, currencies. And of course where, the, where, where nature and natural resources and all other uh, essential items for our economic production are in the commons, not, uh, they are not privatized. And that includes land. The third crucial pillar to this or circle would be social justice. We have a world which is extremely unequal in many different ways, whether it's gender or it's class or it's caste or it's age or it's ability uh, or it's race or it's ethnicity and the struggles for actually creating greater equality for, uh, for achieving equity in, in social uh, aspects, in, in distribution, in benefits and so on. Um, that's very much again part of, the, of that future. Uh, vision and you can see again many many different struggles of this kind I mean for instance the revolutions that have taken place in gender justice uh, in the last century are, are, are uh, uh, examples of what can happen um, uh, the social justice of course also includes well-being it means uh, it includes satisfaction it means sort of bringing back qualitative relationships bringing back uh, the importance of, of, of personal and collective satisfaction and happiness and well-being and and peace in our lives. The fourth uh, major circle is uh, cultural and knowledge diversity. Uh, you know, the human world is, is blessed with an incredible amount of cultural diversity uh, around the world. I mean, in India alone, for instance, there are almost 800 living languages, and incredible amounts of uh, culinary and food diversity and so on. This is actually a source of strength. It's a source of resilience for human societies to have this cultural diversity and also knowledge diversity. It's not only science and technology or modern knowledge which is important for us. It's also all kinds of other traditional knowledge, the intuitive knowledge uh, that, that people have, that indigenous peoples, for instance, have had for thousands of years. Uh, bringing these sorts of uh, different diverse knowledges and cultures together and having knowledge as part of the commons rather than again privatized with intellectual property rights and so on. And again you see elements of this in things like copyleft or creative commons or open source uh, software, many other ways in which people are actually and also movements of reviving languages that are other, otherwise disappearing or reviving cultures that are otherwise disappearing while being open to exchanging with other cultures. This is not about getting becoming closed and xenophobic, xenophobic which is happening in parts of uh, any all parts of the world actually, but really opening up to other cultures also. And finally of course the fifth circle, the most important in many senses, is ecological resilience and wisdom. I mean if we don't save the earth, if, if we don't respect the limits of the earth, if we don't respect other species, then of course we ourselves will perish as human beings. So that's the fifth crucial circle. Now, 
these five interlocking circles uh, or the vision of radical ecological democracy uh, have to be based on a foundation of uh, it's, it's the world views that we have, the values, the ethical values, the principles, the, uh, the elements of, of spirituality, of, of uh, relationship with, with nature and with each other, which are based on a sense of collective, on a sense of responsibility, on you know, for instance, uh, the Africans talk about Ubuntu, which is that I am because we are, not I am because I think or I am because I own a car. Um, or we take Swaraj in India, which is really about my independence and autonomy or my community's independence and autonomy in relation to my responsibility towards your and your community's uh, autonomy and freedom. So it's a combination of rights and responsibilities of personal going within oneself and relating to uh, those outside of oneself. Uh, you take Boin Vivier and Suma Kause and many others from South America, they have very similar notions of well-being, which is well-being not just for humans, but also for all life. Um, so the, the world views that we espouse, which are actually so very different from the dominant set of a world view, the sort of which, which the dominant economy and polity tells us that we have to be selfish, we have to be individualistic, we have to become famous and rich and so on. Um, as opposed to that kind of thing, these are worldviews of collectivity which, which, uh, which are re-emerging in many parts of the world as part of movements. And they are crucial for, for the future. Um, having painted some kind of a vision for the future, of course, there are many, many questions that arise. How do we get there? What are the pathways? What are the strategies of, of getting there? How do we network all the thousands of different initiatives which are happening on the ground, the concepts that are coming up, which have come up from the past from great thinkers like Gandhi and Marx and so on, or which are coming from the bottom up from indigenous peoples and communities and, and so on all over the world. Um, what will be the role? Of, will there be a role for the state in this future? If so, what? Will there be a role for business? If so, what? Um, what is what will be the relationship between the individual and the collective, where both are respected? Um, and most important, who will be the agency of transformation? How, who is going to actually take this forward? Is it going to be political parties, people's movements, students, youth? You know, these are all questions I think that, that need uh, much more discussion uh, and, and debate. Um, I think that Collectively, uh, I can see in many parts of the world we're embarking on on a very exciting journey. We have lots of challenges. We have, I think, for the next few years in the foreseeable sort of short term period, we are going to collapse more with with climate, with uh, economic crises, with social conflicts, with and so on. There will be greater strife, greater conflicts, greater collapse. But if we are able to maintain and nurture the incredible signs of hope that we have sprouting up all over the place in the world, um, those will be providing us the answers for emerging from these collapses and rebuilding a society which is far more sustainable, equitable and just. I for one have a lot of hope that by 2050 we will be firmly on that path. Thank you. For those interested, uh, please take a look at the two websites given here. The first one is about India, which documents more than 400 stories of alternative transformations. The second one is a sort of initial uh, blog on ideas of radical ecological democracy. And that's my email in case anybody would like to get in touch. Thank you. Bye-bye.